My name is Paul Walsh and I work as a Learning and Development Specialist at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, and currently, my role involves uh, some quite uh, traditional transactional elements of training and development, which is being in the classroom and working with groups of colleagues, uh, training around areas around management and leadership development, and around professional development as well. Um, in addition to that, there are a lot of wider areas of development that I might work in, so supporting individuals in maybe coaching relationships, uh, and also supporting team and organisational development projects as well. So, like most people, uh, I would talk about getting into learning development almost by accident. A lot of people in my profession would say that because typically what happens is um, do a job, get proficient at the job, and then become involved in training other people. And what I've always really enjoyed about it is it's partly working with individuals so I'm really interested in how people work so on the individual level but also socially and how they interact with each other so my undergraduate degree was organisational behaviour which was all about organisational psychology and sociology of teams and I think seeing that play out in the workplace is something that I really enjoy but even if I'm delivering the same training course numerous times to people in the organisation, which I have done, every single time I deliver that will be different because the experience and the personality of people bring into the room are really different. So that side of it will always keep me on my toes. And I think what I also enjoy about it is, particularly on the organisational development side and team development, is dealing with the complexity of issues that might be quite ambiguous where there isn't really a clearly defined solution, there might not even be a clearly defined problem. One of the things I've really enjoyed is developing really deep relationships with, with people who I work with. Mm. So if I'm working with people in a coaching relationship, then I might be meeting with them every few weeks over a period of you know, a few weeks, months or years, actually seeing them develop and growing confidence and growing in terms of the capability. That, that is really rewarding. The willingness to be challenged, to be clear, if I'm working with people who are facing redeployment or redundancy, then that is a difficult time for them. And sometimes that is quite challenging for me, partly because they might be directing frustration at me, and partly because it's providing a safe container for them uh, to, to talk about their difficulties um, and it's really important to have structures in place to support myself within that. So for example with coaching, I get coaching supervision which is really important to me to make sure that I know that I'm doing the right thing and I'm not doing anything that's going to be harmful to myself or to other people. Um, I think the other thing that can be really challenging uh, and I found difficult times is dealing with ambiguity. So I've got to be comfortable with not knowing and with the fact that the client doesn't know as well. And I've got to be clear with the client that it's fine for them not to know the answer and that something will emerge as we gather data and as we work through their problems. What is really helpful of being an internal consultant is that I know some of the territory so sometimes in trying to support uh, the colleagues in coming to solutions that are going to help them, um, they don't have to spend so much time getting me up to speed on what's going on. And it's quicker for me to immerse myself in their context because I know a bit of the territory already. So that is really helpful. I think what is challenging is that sometimes I'm part of the system. So I work within the university's HR department. So sometimes for people to share everything with somebody who seems part of HR can be quite difficult. It's, it's a bit easier coming in as an external because it's really clear that I'm disinterested. I'm not uninterested, but I would be disinterested. And so it can be easier in that as an external I wouldn't have preconceptions and that the people seeing me wouldn't have preconceptions. But that would also bring pressure because if I was an external I would be billing on an hourly rate and there'll be an expectation that things would be turned through more quickly, whereas maybe as an internal, I probably have more capacity 
to, to work with teams through quite a long journey. A few key strands around that. So first of all is making sure that people are competent to do the job. So we might have people appointed into roles 10 years ago and the role they're doing now is completely different. It looks different to what it was 10 years ago. So to make that journey, people need some sort of development support within it. And I think in terms of succession planning and retention, it's so, so horizontal development, somebody doing the job now, vertical development, what could they progress into? And I think being able to grow our own talent it's really, really important because it means if people can step in, they can they don't have to acclimatise to the organisation when they take on that promotion. That does help retention in itself because people think, well, I can have a career here and I can progress. It's really difficult to capture because I think a lot of people default to seeing learning is happening in a classroom. And that bit of seeing their job as their main source of learning, you know, I, I, I've not cracked it, none of us have cracked it. We talk a lot, like most organisations, about 70, 20, 10 development. So this idea of 70% is on the job, 20% is learning from other people, 10% is formal interventions with somebody like me, or through reading, or through, through e-learning. Well, I think the not to crack is how L&D and OD can facilitate that 70 and 20% development. So it's not just about developing people in a classroom like this. If you take the 20% learn, learning of other people, there's a huge piece of work around coaching and mentoring. So providing development interventions that bring in people's own real life work. So it's trying to blend in the learning to the everyday job. There are a couple of ways in. So one way is through the HR route. So some people come into L&D because they've maybe done a HR qualification and then they'll do some operational HR and then maybe move across into an L&D So that's one way in, and that way is quite structured. The, the other way to it, so the way that I got into it, um, and the way a lot of L&D people get into it, is actually in doing any job, whether that's being a holiday rep or working in an office, is to get good at the job and take any opportunity to support other people. If, if you've got a mind to look out for those opportunities, really quickly, loads of opportunities will present themselves for doing bits of training. And then once you've got that experience, it's much easier to then start looking at specialist L&D roles. I think the other thing that is really key for anybody working in L&D is being curious about what I sometimes call it being nosy, but I need to have a fundamental interest in why people think and behave the way that they do, because that generally is the key to them unlocking change and development for those individuals.